Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to my June reading wrap up. So today I'm going to be telling you about all the things I've read in June. This month I have been participating in Japanese June, so nine out of the twelve books I read were Japanese literature and then the other three were two Victorian buddy reads that I got distracted by and then also continuing on with my re-reading slash listening to Harry Potter on audiobook. So I will start off with all the Japanese books I read this month and then I will carry on to the final three at the end of the video. So let's start off with the classics and first I'm going to talk about The Book of Tea. This is a non-fiction piece, it was written in English by a Japanese man in 1906 and basically it's a series of essays examining Japanese culture at the turn of the century. The way it explains the role that tea plays in Japanese culture and the role of the tea ceremony I found was absolutely fascinating and I really really enjoyed it. I really liked reading this essay collection but I don't think this is a good place to start with Japanese literature if you're not very familiar with Japanese history or culture. There were times when I was only just managing to follow it because of the, the way that it deals with various historical and cultural things that I didn't know that much about, but if you are quite interested in Japanese history then I think this will really interest you. Next I read Life of a Counterfeiter by Yasushi Inu, and this was translated by Michael Emmerich. I really really enjoyed this, it's three short stories, the first one, Life of a Counterfeiter, is much longer, and the other two, Reed's and Mr Goodall's gloves, are much shorter. So in the Life of a Counterfeiter there is a man who is writing the biography of this great artist, and in his research he discovers that this great artist had a friend who had been counterfeiting his paintings and selling them and this man, the biographer, begins to investigate the situation and to try and find out what's happening and when he should be researching for the biography of the great artist he becomes kind of much more fascinated actually with the life of the counterfeiter. You never see the counterfeiter directly even though this story is all about him, this is a man that always remains at a distance and you only ever get like glimpses of him and I really liked how that was done, I thought it was done incredibly well. I really enjoy writing where there is a first person narrator who is not the central character, I think it's a really interesting technique and something I really enjoy so I would highly highly recommend this, I think it's very very enjoyable and I think Yusushi Inu just writes wonderfully. And my other Japanese classic this month was The Makioka Sisters by Tanazaki and this was translated by Edward G. Sidestecker. I really really enjoyed this, this book was written in the 40s and is set just before the Second World War. It's basically a story about this family, these sisters who are the Makioka sisters. There are four sisters, the two elder sisters of the four are married, one lives slightly further away with her husband and then one sister, the second sister, lives with her husband and also with the two younger sisters and the book is basically about the family's decline in fortune and in reputation and about their struggles to try and get the two younger sisters married. It's a really melancholy book at times, like it deals with a lot of hard stuff and is quite emotional and hard-hitting but it's really beautifully and tenderly done and what is at the heart of this this book is the relationship between these sisters and it is done incredibly well. I think this is a book that if you haven't read much Japanese literature or if you haven't read many Japanese classics but you really like Pride and Prejudice this is a book you'll probably like. It's very very different in tone to Pride and Prejudice, it's much darker and much less funny than Pride and Prejudice. There isn't like a, a central romance but if you like Pride and Prejudice for the relationship between the sisters and for the way it deals with the position of women in society and the social pressures on women to get married then this is a book that I think you'll really enjoy. Moving on to some more contemporary reads, I also read Strange Weather in Tokyo. This is by Hiromi Kawakama and is translated by Alison Markin Powell. I didn't really enjoy this, it's about a woman in her late 30s who runs into her old high school Japanese teacher. They start off this kind of relationship in which they are just friends but there is always the hint of something more beneath the surface. I really liked the basic setup and the premise and I found some aspects of their relationship interesting but I found the pacing of this book really weird, like the last chapter for me was the most interesting and it felt to me like all the chapters leading up to the last chapter should have been half the book and the final chapter should have been another half of the book, like it felt like it was just wrongly paced. And the other thing, I just found the writing really odd. Some of the phrasing, especially to do with dialogue, was very very odd and there was a lot of like really 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 long dialogue with then like a really long dialogue tag on the end which just felt really clumsy. Sometimes for the dialogue there were speech marks and sometimes there wasn't and I don't mind having speech marks and I don't mind not having speech marks. I don't even mind if a book has sometimes speech marks and sometimes not if it makes sense why but like in this book you'd be reading a conversation and half the sentences of dialogue would have speech marks and half of them wouldn't for no apparent reason and it would just be like in the middle of a conversation the speech marks would just disappear and then they'd return. I couldn't see any reason for it and I found it infuriating 
infuriating to read. It just felt like the book hadn't been proofread. I have no idea if that's a translation issue because I have no idea how dialogue works in Japanese, but it just felt really odd and it was one of many things, one of many small things about this book that kind of annoyed me. Another book I did not especially love was Colourless Tazuru Tezeki and His Years of Pilgrimage by Haruki Murakami, translated by Philip Gabriel. I've read two Murakami books before. I loved Norwegian Wood, I didn't like Kafka on the Shore, and I didn't like this. I think the thing I find about Murakami is I always feel like I could really love his books if they were just slightly different. Like I loved the premise at the heart of this book. It is about this man who when he was at school had these four incredibly close friends and then a few years after school they completely cut all contact with him and he never saw them again and it kind of broke him. And then when he's much older his new girlfriend persuades him to go and find these friends and work out what happened all those years ago. And I loved that premise and I think it could have been so brilliant and it could have been the premise of a book I loved but the execution of the premise was just not not what I enjoyed at all. I loved Norwegian wood a lot but there are two things that bothered me about Norwegian wood that I felt bothered me much more in this. One was that I felt Norwegian Wood ended a little too soon and I felt like it wasn't quite as resolved as I would have liked it. And another thing was the need of the central male character to sleep with everybody. And in The Colourless Tsuru Tezeki, I found the ending very, very annoying. I felt like there were so many things that were unresolved. And I don't mind slightly ambiguous endings, but when it ends in the place that this book ends, it just feels like it stopped five pages too soon. I hear a lot of people say they have a problem with Haruki Murakami's presentation of women. And I'm not certain that that is what to have a problem with. I think more what I have a problem with is his presentation of sex and his need to sexualise situations that really don't need to be sexualised and it's just unnecessary and it just makes you feel like, well, I think Freud would have a field day with Haruka Murakami's writing but I am, I am not a fan. You know, I sometimes just feel like Haruka Murakami is sat there at his desk trying to work out ways in which to make his protagonist sleep with everyone and if he can't sleep with them in real life then he better sleep with them in a dream. I didn't especially enjoy this. I don't know whether or not to continue with Haruka Murakami because, like I said, I did, I did really enjoy Norwegian Wood but I think maybe he's just not for me, I don't know. But on to happier things, let us talk about the glorious Banani Yoshimoto. This month I read Kitchen by Banani Yoshimoto, this is translated by Megan Backus. I have read this before, this was a reread, this was the book I read over a year ago, it was what got me into Banani Yoshimoto and what got me into Japanese literature. I loved this the first time I read it, I loved it again. I feel like it didn't have quite as great an impact on me as when I read it for the first time. When I read this for the first time I'd never read anything like it and I was so stunned. But now I've read all of her body of work so it was slightly less surprising but I still really really enjoyed it. This book is divided into two stories. The first called Kitchen. It's about a young woman and after the death of her grandmother she gets taken in by this family and creates a strong bond with the boy, the son of this family and also the mother who is transgender and it's about her relationships with those family. And, and then the second story, Moonlight Shadow, is about a young woman who has just lost her long term boyfriend of four years and it's about how she copes with that. What I really love about Kitchen is how food is really important in it, which sounds like an odd thing but it's just done so beautifully. The way that people are connected by food and the way that food brings people together and that people show their feelings through food is just lovely and something I really really enjoy in Banami Yoshimoto's writing and I think it's so wonderful. It's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant piece of literature. Please, please read it. And I also read my final Banami Yoshimoto which is Amrita. This is the last Banami Yoshimoto book that has been translated into English that I hadn't read. It isn't my favourite Banami Yoshimoto and I think that's partly because it's so long and normally I really like long books but there's something about Banana Yoshimoto's writing style, her intensely beautiful, wonderful writing style that I think works much better for shorter novels and for short fiction. Like I did really enjoy Amrita but it feels kind of messy or patchworky, like the plot never really hangs together and I kind of didn't mind that. As I got used to it I began to really enjoy it. It feels episodic and actually it's just you're just reading about someone's life and so that is what life is like. There isn't a consistent plot which makes perfect sense throughout and things do happen that seem odd and unconnected and you do have to look for the connections in strange ways but it doesn't feel as perfect a piece of literature as a lot of her other work in my opinion. Basically what this book is about is there is a young woman and her sister dies, her sister commits suicide. Shortly after that this young woman, our narrator, falls down the stairs and hits her head and these two events kind of set off the rest of the book. I thought the human relationships was done very very well in this and as always her dialogue and her writing is beautiful and interesting. I love the relationship between Saku and her brother. I wouldn't recommend this as the place to start with Banana Yoshimoto, I would say Kitchen is the place to start but I do still really enjoy this and yes I really hope more of her work gets translated into English in the future. So finally before I move 
on to my non-Japanese reads this month, I want to talk about my favourite Japanese book this month. In fact, I think my favourite book this month, which is Revenge by Yoko Ajawa, translated by Stephen Snyder. So what I didn't know about this book before I started reading it was that it's not a novel, it's a collection of short stories. And would you like to know what kind of collection of short stories it is? It is an interconnected collection of short stories, which is my favourite thing. People pass people by in the street, or they pass by events that are mentioned in other stories. They live below the murder scene that happened in the previous story, and it's just wonderful. I love those kind of short story collections because they're so rewarding. You know, when I started reading this and I read the first few stories and I wasn't really sure why it was called Revenge because, you know, there were just various stories about people's lives and people's relationships and then the revenge starts to occur. If you do not like gore and violence, you probably won't like this. Like, they're not overly graphic, but there's a lot of murder in this book, and it's done absolutely brilliantly. Every time it's shocking, even though there are quite a lot of murders in this book, and you know the title of the short story collection is Revenge, and you're expecting it, every time it is still shocking, and that is brilliant. It's such a surprising, wonderful book. It is written absolutely brilliantly, and all of the stories work fascinatingly on their own. So much of this book is so good. I'm sure it will be one of my favourites of the year, and I'm definitely looking forward to reading more by this author in the future because she is incredible. So there we have it, that is the Japanese literature that I read in June, but I do still have three more books to talk to you about. So one other thing I read this month was the audiobook of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire has always been my least favourite Harry Potter book, and I actually really enjoyed listening to it on audiobook more than I thought I would. Because I think J.K. Rowling puts her plots together quite carefully and quite cleverly, I really enjoy reading or listening to Harry Potter knowing all the plot and knowing what happens, because you can pick out where she drops hints along the way. There are certain things about the Goblet of Fire that do make it a bit annoying. Ron spends most of the book being incredibly frustrating and some of the like teenager romance drama I think when I was a teenager I found quite irritating. Now I found it quite entertaining, much more entertaining I think than I found when I was a teenager. Anyway I, I did quite enjoy that. So with the usual hardy team with Yamini from the Skeptical Reader, Alicia from Ex Libris and Anne from Beyond the Pages, we buddy read Thomas Hardy's Desperate Remedies. Now this is Thomas Hardy's first novel, or first published novel, and so we were all kind of expecting it to be not that good. We didn't have that high expectations, but actually this is incredible and we all really enjoyed it. And I, I don't really know why this hasn't become more famous because I think this is a really, really accessible and brilliant Hardy. It is so pacey so dramatic. There is a lot of mystery in this which I greatly enjoyed. There is a young woman called Cythria, she lives with her brother Owen, and after the death of their father they discover that they don't have very much money left. Cythria decides that she needs to make money for herself and she goes and ends up working for a woman called Miss Acliffe. Now there are two men in Cythria's life. There is a man called Edward Springrove who she falls in love with quite early on in the book, but when she goes to live with Miss Acliffe she meets another man, a Mr Marsden, and everything carries on from there. But I wouldn't say this book is a love story at its heart, I would say this is a mystery novel. It is so dramatic and so pacey and so so wonderfully compelling and gripping, despite the fact that my lovely beautiful old 70s copy decided to spoil and give away the entire plot on the back of the book. I still found it incredibly gripping and could just couldn't put it down. It was so so compelling and very 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 pacey for a Victorian novel so I would really very highly recommend this. And the last book I have to talk to you about today was Daniel Deronda by George Eliot. So I buddy read Daniel Deronda with Anne from Beyond the Pages, Alicia from Ex Libris and also Caroline from BB Seagull, I will link their channels down below. Now I have been avoiding George Eliot for some time because I read Middlemarch and Silas Marner when I was about 15 and I didn't love either of them, I didn't hate them, I just found her writing a bit dull. But actually I really enjoyed Daniel Deronda. I still found her writing not that thrilling and I found, as I found with Middlemarch, that sometimes she just spends time with the wrong characters. There are quite a lot of characters in this book that are quite minor who I would have loved to spend more time with. Miss Arrowpoint, Herr Kelsmer, Mira, those characters were fascinating fascinating and we didn't get as much time with them as I would have liked. However, I do think this book has a lot of fascinating stuff in it. This book has two central strands to it. One is about a young woman called Gwendolyn Harleth. Her family are fallen on hard times, they have been very high in society and lose all of their money. She is being pursued by a suitor who she is slightly dubious about and everything kind of carries on from there. The other half of the book is about Daniel Deronda. Daniel Deronda is the ward of a wealthy man but he doesn't know much about his own parent and she has no idea who his mother is. And although he suspects that the man who has brought him up is his biological father, he can't prove that. And fairly early on in the book Daniel saves a young Jewish woman 
woman from drowning. And in his friendship with Mira, he discovers a lot more about the Jewish community in London and in Victorian society as a whole. I really love the look into Jewish history in this book, and I think it's something that is not dealt with in very many Victorian novels. A lot of Victorian society was quite anti-Semitic, and this book deals with Judaism and what it was like to be Jewish in the 19th century. I thought that aspect of the book was very, very good. And there was another aspect of the book that I really loved and found really fascinating. I'm very interested in gender and how gender operates within Victorian literature. I've spoken about this a bit before, but within Victorian literature there is a trope of these kind of angelic moral women who moralise the kind of bad men in their lives. And in Daniel Deronda you have Daniel, a man who is a beacon and a symbol of morality, whereas Gwendolyn is much less moral than Daniel. And at various points in the book he seems to kind of moralise her and I think that's really fascinating from like a gender perspective so I found the way that Daniel and Gwendolyn and morality works in this book really really fascinating and that was an aspect of it that made it like especially interesting to me so yes I enjoyed this more than I was expecting to and I think I will carry on and read some more George Eliot in the future and of course the other thing I read this month was this month's three chapters of Our Mutual Friend if you're not aware I'm currently hosting a Victorian style serialised read-along of Charles Dickens's Our Mutual Friend I'll put a link down below to the Goodreads group and to my video discussion discussion on the three chapters for this month and I'm looking forward to reading the next three chapters next month. So yes those have been all the books I read in the month of June. Please let me know what you have been reading in the month of June and what your favourite book of the month was. I'll be back on Thursday with my non-reading wrap up for the last two months so I'll be telling you about theatre and film and music and booktube and writing and other stuff in my life that happens when I'm not reading. That is all I have for this time and I'll be back very soon with another video.